This is quibiazin, an alleged anti-cancer drug. The American Medical Association, the American Cancer Society, and the federal government consider it worthless. In spite of the conclusiveness of their opinion, however, the drug has remained in active use for more than 12 years. We interviewed Mrs. Julia Hotnett and Dr. Anthony Despirito in Neptune, New Jersey. Kathy was a perfectly healthy baby when she was born. By her birth, she followed three wonderful boys. At the age of four, simply because she looked so badly and her appetite was so poor, we had taken her to our family physician and he told us she had to go into the hospital for tests. They decided there must be Rome's tumor. After the operation, we were told there were so many organs removed from her and the tumor itself was so very large and malignant that her chances for recovery was extremely poor. In order to prolong her for six months, 25 x-ray treatments were prescribed. Kathy was unable to tolerate them. We were further told that there was nothing further medical science could do for her. At this time, we turned to Kabaisen, although we were only promised by Dr. Ivy a year for Kathy. To prolong her only for a year, Kathy reacted beautifully to it immediately. This child that hasn't been drinking and eating and playing she began to eat, requesting foods and, and different things and, and played uh, little by little. She became a normal child. On April 28th of 1960, she received her last x-ray treatment. A few days later, she was started on Probiacin in New York City. When Mrs. Hodnett returned to uh, her home, I refused to give Probiacin because I knew very little about the drug and felt that there was no scientific evidence uh, to the fact that it would help Kathy. A little later on, I began to give Kathy her Probiacin again, much as I would give some psychotherapy to other patients. It was obviously not doing her any harm but her improvement coincided with the stopping of x-ray therapy and the end of radiation sickness. Now, since Krabiasin was started and the child improved, the mother attributes her child's improvement to the Krabiasin. However, I must emphatically say that there is no true scientific evidence in this case that Krabiasin has been of any benefit. Conflicting opinions such as these have given rise to a controversy marked by a complexity and emotionalism unparalleled in the annals of modern medicine. Krabiasin. Is it or isn't it worthless? On September 7, 1963, the United States Food and Drug Administration announced that its chemists had identified the alleged anti-cancer agent Krabiazin as a common amino acid called creatine. Creatine is known to be totally ineffective in the treatment of cancer. Claims and counterclaims regarding Krabiazin have perplexed the public for more than 12 years. It now appears that the drug's long and stormy history is reaching its final chapter. The purpose of this program is to present an objective, impartial report. We take no stand as to Krabiazin's value. We will, however, look at the course of its development and use, and at the doctors, patients, and organizations most involved in the controversy up to now. Perhaps one of the major reasons this medical dilemma could occur today may be found in the nature of cancer itself, a still mysterious, elusive, and frightful disease. This is a normal cell, the basic unit of all life. It reproduces itself in an orderly, controlled way. This cell is reproducing itself abnormally, without control. It is a cancer cell. The cause of its fatal activity is still unknown. Nearly 300,000 Americans will die of cancer during the next year. The disease will most likely strike first in the colon or rectum, on the skin, or in the breasts and lungs. Unless the cancer is halted at these points, it will spread or metastasize. Until medical science discovers a preventive, one out of every four of us will become a cancer victim.
Last year, more school children died of cancer than of any other disease, nearly 5,000 under age 15. Half of these were victims of a cancer of blood-forming tissue known as leukemia. More than 22,000 people between 15 and 44 die every year of cancer. It is the chief killer of women between 30 and 54. Cancer strikes most often in old age. It is ironic that medical science, in advancing against such once fatal diseases as tuberculosis, has now enabled us to live longer than we did 50 years ago, long enough to die more painfully with cancer. More than $200 million of public and private funds are spent annually in searching for the causes of cancer. In treating the disease, three main methods are used today, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. A tumor can most easily be removed by surgery if it is found in time and confined to its site of origin. Its removal, however, does not guarantee that cancer won't strike the patient again. Another treatment which is often successful is radiation, sometimes used with surgery, sometimes by itself. However, individual patients vary in their ability to tolerate radiation and its side effects can be as harmful as the cancer itself. These buildings are the National Institutes of Health at Bethesda, Maryland. Among its vast complex of laboratories and clinics is the National Cancer Institute, where much recent research has been focused on the third method of treatment, chemotherapy. This method, still in its experimental stages, utilizes drugs, chemicals, and hormones to counteract malignant growth. Every year, the government collects from all over the world and stores here more than 50,000 different chemicals and natural products, ranging from tree barks to animal wastes. Before any substance is used on a human, however, it must be tested extensively on animals who have been given various forms of cancer. The tests are designed to determine whether the substance is active against the cancer in any way, and whether it is toxic or non-toxic. Under present federal law, full documentation on animal tests must be provided by every manufacturer who applies for permission to distribute a drug for investigational use on humans. Medical science acknowledges the anti-cancer activity of only a few drugs being used currently on human patients. All of these, however, are toxic or have undesirable side effects which limit their application. The production of the controversial drug Crabiazin begins here on an Illinois horse farm. Although the government asserts that this substance shows no anti-cancer activity of any kind, it does acknowledge that Crabiazin is not toxic. This is Dr. Stevan Dorovic, discoverer of Crabiazin. A Yugoslav-born and trained physician, he came to the United States in 1949 after having spent most of the war years in Argentina. During the past 14 years, he has pursued his investigation of Crabiazin using it on animals and advanced cancer patients and claiming for the drug definite anti-cancer activity. To manufacture crabiazin, Dr. Dorovic injects horses with an extract of a mold called Actinomyces bovis. As a result of this injection, the horses become ill. To combat the illness, according to Dr. Dorovic, the horses secrete into the blood in larger than normal quantities a growth controlling or anti-cancer substance which he has named crabiazin. At the peak of illness, some three or four weeks later, the horses are bled. In a specially designed centrifuge, the blood is broken down into red blood cells and serum. The serum contains crabiazin. According to Dr. Dorovic, in making his most recent batch of the substance in 1961, 200 horses were required to produce five grams of crabiazin. Final stages of crabiazin manufacture take place at Dr. Dorovic's Promac Laboratories in Chicago. Here the blood serum is extracted with an organic solvent, then the organic solvent is evaporated. The residue is extracted several times with distilled water, and a semi-crystalline material is obtained. This is crabiazin in its final state, considered by its sponsors to be a hormone. We are observing the basic steps involved in making crabiazin. It is the contention of the Food and Drug Administration, however, that full details of these procedures have never been disclosed. According to Dr. Dorovic, 
Each ampule used by patients contains one one hundredth of a milligram of crobiazin dissolved in one cubic centimeter of mineral oil. Promac Laboratories makes crobiazin available to the Crobiazin Research Foundation, a nonprofit organization. A donation of $9.50 per ampule is requested of the patients to cover the cost of production. The government claims that the actual cost is but a small fraction of this amount. The chief reason for Crobiazin's survival in the face of opposition by both the government and organized medicine is the continued support given the drug by one of the nation's most eminent physiologists, Dr. Andrew Conway Ivey. Dr. Ivey is the recipient of half a dozen honorary degrees as well as a dozen international awards. Organizer of the Naval Medical Research Institute, Bethesda, Maryland. Former executive director of the National Advisory Cancer Council. Former board member, American Cancer Society. Vice president, University of Illinois, 1946 to 1953. In 1946, at the recommendation of the American Medical Association Board of Trustees, he served as special consultant to the Secretary of War in connection with the trials of Nazi medical criminals at Nuremberg. He was the only Allied representative selected to testify regarding universally accepted medical ethics. Today, at 70, Dr. Ivey occasionally lectures without salary at Roosevelt University. He spends most of his time, however, on crobiazin research. For many years, he and his wife, also a doctor, have been compiling statistics drawn from 4,200 crobiazin case histories. He is also investigating some of these still unknown chemical properties of crobiazin itself, in the hope that eventually it can be produced by simpler, less expensive methods. For many years, he has maintained regular contact with 50 advanced cancer patients whom he treats with crobiazin at no charge in order to gather complete data on the drug's effectiveness. Although he remains in close contact with Dr. Dorovic on crobiazin matters, he has never participated in the Promac Laboratory's manufacturing process. Instead, he long ago evolved his own methods of producing the substance from the tissue of horses rather than from the serum. For his association with crobiazin, Dr. Ivey was discredited by the scientific community. He was suspended by the Chicago Medical Society for three months. He was deprived of his post as vice president of the University of Illinois, and he voluntarily resigned from the American Medical Association. We spoke with doctors Ivey and Dorovic at Promac Laboratories in Chicago. Dr. Ivey, what first convinced you that crobiazin might have value in the treatment of cancer? Well, I was <clears throat> convinced first because since 1917, I have believed that there is an anti-cancer substance in the blood serum and tissues of multicellular animals. When Dr. Dorovi came to me in August 1949 and told me that he had isolated such a substance from the blood serum of horses and had shown that it is effective, and I saw the protocols, in dogs and cats with spontaneous advanced cancer. Then I was convinced that it should be tried on the human patients with advanced cancer. So we started and within three or four weeks, I had seen myself a decrease in size of the tumor and a decrease in pain. Despite your claims, Dr. Ivey, the medical profession as a whole has said that a test is not justified because your patients didn't have cancer in the first place because the results you claimed came from delayed x-ray and surgical treatment and because you were not qualified to interpret the clinical results. Let's take up uh, each question separately. First, uh, I am not qualified. I've been doing cancer research and seeing patients with cancer since 1917. And furthermore, facts speak for themselves. The charge that the patients did not have cancer in the first place is simply not true. Such a charge could not be made by any person who had gone over our records because they would find that there was a microscopic diagnosis of the tumor and past history generally of surgery with a microscopic diagnosis on the specimen. Regarding the third charge, 
that the favorable results were due to delayed surgery or x-ray therapy, I should like to point out that we have a relatively large group of patients who received neither x-ray nor surgery, and the results were the same. If all this is true, Dr. Ivey, why is organized medicine so strongly opposed to probiasin? Because in October 1951, a report was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which uh, concluded that cribiazin had practically no value, or implied that it had no value, and it also mentioned that cribiazin is a secret remedy. I tried to reply and tell the truth about cribiazin, but I, I was turned down. And at the present time, the doctors in this country only have available to them this uh, inaccurate report of in the Journal of the American Medical Association. We can prove that the AMA report was partially falsified and entirely superficial. Dr. Derovic, one charge that has been made repeatedly is that cribiazin is a secret remedy because you never have fully disclosed the manufacturing process. This is simply not true. Since 1951, Dr. Ivy and I have disclosed and published many times the technological data regarding production of cribiazin. This was done first time in 1951. Thereafter, in 1954, 56, 59, and last time in 1961, in now report to National Cancer Institute. In order to spike that charge, I have publicly been inviting anyone who really wants to know how to make cribiazin to come to my laboratory and work one or two months without salary, and they will learn how to make it. No one has accepted this invitation until about a month ago when a medical student whose mother had hopeless cancer came to my laboratory and said that he wanted to learn how to make cribiazin and all other aspects of the subject of cribiazin. Dr. Derovic, another charge is that your Promac Laboratories has made a great deal of money from the distribution of cribiazin. This is another false statement. Cribiazin never was sold. From 1949 until 1954, all cribiazin was given at no cost to anyone. 1954, our financial resources were exhausted, and we wrote to our research physicians that we would have to stop our study if they do not help us to pay cost of production and other expenses. Without exception, their reply was that we should not stop our study and that they will get some financial help from their patient for us. Since then, patients are contributing for cribazin according to their ability. However, majority of the patients have received cribazin without any contribution. And no patient were refused cribazin on the basis of his financial inability. Charges and countercharges have marked the entire history of cribiazin. A major stigma that has never been erased is the manner in which the drug was first presented to the medical community at a Chicago hotel in 1951. Instead of employing the usual procedure, publishing a paper in a scientific journal, Dr. Ivey called a meeting of doctors, cancer experts, and science journalists. However, an unauthorized press release announcing that a cancer cure had been found at last caused near hysterical public interest. Dr. Ivey has denied issuing that release, the origin of which remains unknown to this day. The premature public interest in cribiazin compelled the AMA to undertake an immediate investigation of the drug. And a report on 100 cases was published in the AMA journal in October 1951. It concluded that the histories gave no evidence of cribiazin's value. Upon publication, the cribiazin proponents not only disagreed with the report's conclusions, but charged that it contained 23 falsified cases and that 12 patients reported dead or dying were, in fact, still alive. In spite of two further committee reports, both unfavorable, 
Dr. Ivey's prestige remained high with the Illinois legislature. Alarmed by the increasing controversy, the legislators in 1953 appointed a commission to determine whether or not there was a conspiracy against Krabiazin and its sponsors. Testimony at the hearings was given under oath. False statements could make a witness liable for criminal contempt. Target of the most serious accusation was Dr. J.J. J. Moore, treasurer of the AMA at the time of its Krabiazin status report and a well-known Chicago pathologist. Dr. Dorovic charged that Dr. Moore tried to get him to give distribution rights of the drug to two businessmen, friends of Dr. Moore. Dr. Dorovic asserted that Dr. Moore, when denied any participation for his friends, threatened to destroy Krabiazin, Dr. Dorovic, and Dr. Ivey through his influence in the AMA and at the university. Dr. Ivey testified as to the pressures brought to bear on him to dissociate himself from Krabiazin and Dr. Dorovic. I had a call from a former student of mine whose name I do not now recall, who said that there were certain people out to get me. And then the same afternoon, and that's why I recall it so well, a reporter of the Chicago paper called me up and asked me if I knew that uh, they, certain individuals were out to get my job at the University of Illinois. And I said, no, it's uh, news to me. Then it also confirmed the story which came to me from a Mr. Laura Tanney, who formerly worked with the Dorovics uh, down in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in which he had visited the offices of the AMA and came back to the Dorovics with the story that uh, if I didn't get out of this uh, as an investigation, I'd lose my job at the university. Dr. Moore never testified before the committee, but did make the following remarks to an interviewer. My interest in Kobayasin is to prevent the exploitation and misleading of the American cancer uh, public. Uh, someone must defend that group, and there's no, uh, no uh, group that can defend them, uh, such as the physician. We are the ones that know what uh, cures cancer, when a cancer is cured, and uh, we're the ones that take care of cancer. Well, Dr. Moore, what leads you to believe that uh, Krabiazin is of uh, no value in the treatment of cancer? My own personal experience with the drug and obtaining it for physicians uh, on some of the South Side hospitals, that every patient that has received Krabiazin that, that I have obtained for the physician, and all those that I know I have, have died from cancer. And also, it was backed up by the, uh, the report of the Institute of Medicine at Chicago, the article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, the Council of the Chicago Medical Society, the Executive Committee of the College of Medicine of the University of Illinois, and the Coal Committee of the University of Illinois, which says that this drug is practically valueless in the treatment of cancer. After nearly a year of intermittent sessions, often characterized by confusing, heated, and undocumented testimony, the hearings were adjourned. The Commission finally ruled that no conspiracy had been proved, and suggested that further investigation of Krabiazin be pursued by responsible groups. Despite the AMA's condemnation of Krabiazin as a worthless secret remedy, the drug has remained in active use for more than a decade. Dr. Ivey's reputation was not entirely shattered by the cloak and dagger controversy, and his name continued to sustain interest in the drug on the part of terminal cancer patients, their doctors, and the press. In 1958, Herbert Bailey's a matter of life or death brought the issues before a wider audience. Senator Douglas of Illinois aligned himself at that time with Dr. Ivey in calling for a fair test by the government to determine Krabiazin's value. In February 1963, the government, with Dr. Ivey's cooperation, began to photostat and study 500 Krabiazin case histories in order to determine whether a test should be made by the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Ivey outlined for us what he regarded as one of the best cases in this group. That of Gary Cathcart, a 24-year-old Rhodes Scholar from Cheyenne, Wyoming. When Gary was 11 years old, a tumor started to grow in his lower left abdomen. The tumor was treated with x-rays at the Mayo Clinic. Gary was then operated nine days later, but the tumor could not be removed. A small piece was excised for microscopic examination. It was found to be the most cancerous grade of cancer. The tumor continued to grow 
and two and a half months after the last dose of x-rays, the tumor had almost doubled in size. R was about eight inches in diameter. He was expected to live only a few weeks. Krabiasin was started on June 20th, 1951. Four weeks later, the tumor measured only about one inch in diameter and could hardly be located in the abdomen. Late in July 1951, a visiting surgeon said the decrease in the size of the cancer might have been due to the x-rays which Gary received four months previously. So Krabiasin was stopped. Then the tumor enlarged to two inches in diameter. Krabiasin was started again. The tumor stopped growing. Three months later, it had decreased to half an inch in size. In January 1952, the tumor had increased again to two inches in diameter. The dose of Krabiasin was increased and it could not be found four months later. On one occasion, Gary stopped taking Krabiasin. The tumor grew so large that it obstructed the intestine. A large dose of Krabiasin was given and the tumor rapidly decreased in size and the obstruction was relieved. Now Gary has been on the drug continuously for the past three years. This history of Gary shows that Krabiasin has been required to hold his tumor in check now for 12 years. Gary is a mathematical genius and without Krabiasin, this genius would have been lost. Additional support for the drug has come from a number of doctors throughout the country. In Lebanon, Pennsylvania, we interviewed Dr. F. Allen Rutherford, a general practitioner for 45 years. Dr. Rutherford, what has been your experience in treating cancer patients with crabiacin? It was about nine years ago that I treated my first uh, cancer patient with crabiacin. This individual was dying and had received the last rites of his church before I gave the injection. Uh, five weeks afterwards, he returned to work and he didn't miss a day for seven years to count of illness. The age brackets uh, between three and one half years and uh, 83 years. 97% of the patients that come to me for cabizin uh, therapy have been far advanced or terminal and considered hopeless. Since that, uh, my first case, I have uh, treated 331 others with cabiazin. Uh, based on my experience, I consider cabiazin offers more hope for the cancer victim than any other therapy that I have used. Has your use of cabiazin affected you professionally in any way? It certainly has. There was two cancer patients sent home from the hospital to die. They came to me for uh, cancer, for cabizin therapy, and after a uh, certain uh, length of time in which they received this treatment, they returned to work, and uh, as a result, I was uh, expelled from the hospital staff. I demanded a hearing, received it, I was reinstated and vindicated for what I had done. What is your opinion, sir? of a Krabiasin test being conducted by the National Cancer Institute? I think that the uh, National Cancer Institute should conduct a test. The reason they're not doing it, because I believe that they think that we have a uh, therapy that helps uh, these cancer cases, and uh, that is the main reason why they're not doing this test. If uh, Krabiasin was worthless, as they claim, they'd run the test tomorrow. And since they've done everything possible to prevent a test, I believe they don't want the test to be done. Dr. Aaron Greenberg of Old Saybrook, Connecticut, has been using Krabiasin for several years in a personal attempt to determine its efficacy. Dr. Greenberg, what has your experience been in treating cancer patients with Krabiasin? My experience has been that in most of the cases, even those who have died have at least had the benefit of some relief from the agonizing pain, which very often is associated with cancer. More than the one would expect just by the use of narcotics alone. And in at least two cases, I'm firmly convinced that a curative effect was affected. I certainly feel that this is a non-toxic drug. I feel that there is some merit in it, both from the viewpoint that it relieves pain, that it keeps patients functional 
during whatever period of time they have to live, and that in an occasional case, it seems to affect a cure. Has your use of crobiasin affected your practice? I don't believe so. Uh, my practice has certainly, after 30 years, been as extensive as ever has, as much as I would want to do. And so far as my hospital practice is concerned, uh, I have seen no change whatsoever. I still have all the privileges that I ever have had, other than the fact that I have been unable to use crobiasin in the hospital. Do you think the National Cancer Institute should conduct a crobiasin test? Yes, I very definitely do feel that. I think that it's absolutely necessary that a large enough group, a scientific group, should test this on a large enough series of cases so that we can determine once and for all whether or not this is advantageous or not. Dr. John Pick is a well-known Chicago plastic surgeon. He also practices general medicine and assisted Dr. Ivey in the preparation of the book, Observations on Crobiasin in the Management of Cancer. Since that revealing experience 13 years ago, and covering an experience with over 1,300 patients, I have seen similar results and better uh, <clears throat> from one extreme to the other, from the complete disappearance of cancer to what we call the arrested case, in consequence of which I have devoted these last 13 years in cooperation with Dr. Ivey to put this material to crucial and responsible testing. And the results have been far more encouraging, both statistically and actually, than I have had in using any other form of drug or medicine in the treatment of cancer. Has your use of and association with crobiasin affected you professionally? Well, <clears throat> seriously, I don't know of anyone who has been connected with crobiasin that has not been affected in one way or another. Personally, of course, I have too. Not being disposed to complain, I'll just put it into a few words. It has been made rather difficult for me in several hospitals in Chicago to get time to operate or to get patients into the hospital. And of course these things, as is the case with any highly integrated organization, are always done in a rather subtle manner. They are not put in writing. Do you think a fair test of crobiasin is possible? The objective test is possible qualifiedly under one condition that someone like Dr. Ivey, with an enormous experience in the use of this material, be in some way allowed to be a part of the picture in the testing. Otherwise, the test is still possible but meaningless. According to Dr. Ivey, during the past 12 years, some 4,200 cancer patients turned to crobiasin after having been given only a few weeks or months to live following standard treatment. He claims that 10 to 12 percent of these patients have survived from 4 to 12 years because of crobiasin. The American Medical Association and the government maintain that the crobiasin case histories and the statistics drawn from them have been compiled and interpreted unscientifically. The American Cancer Society shares that view. Dr. Howard Bierman is senior attending physician of the Los Angeles County General Hospital and director of the Institute for Cancer and Blood Research. He is regarded as one of the nation's leading cancer specialists. Uh, about 1951, shortly after uh, Robosin was reported, uh, there uh, was an intensive study of this drug made at the University of California. Approximately 50 cases were uh, studied in the course of the next two or three years, and I had the opportunity as uh, the associate director of the Laboratory of Experimental Oncology, which was a, uh, a branch of the National Cancer Institute, to observe some of these cases. Uh, and then, since that time, I have seen uh, cases who have been treated with crobiasin, uh, who have been purported to have been helped and some not. 
uh, and then uh, on occasion we have employed probiosin on direct trial ourselves, uh, alone or with uh, and in conjunction with other agents. I have never seen any significant subjective, that is, uh, improvement in well-being, uh, a decrease in pain, things that the patient himself describes, or objective uh, benefit from this drug, the objective symptoms being a regression in size of the tumor or a decrease in size of the mass observed on an x-ray film or by direct measurement. Do you feel this experience is conclusive, that the drug could have no value? In my own personal experience, from what I have actually observed, and from what I have read, and uh, in conversations with other qualified investigators who have had uh, uh, experience with this agent, I would say uh, it is not valid. Uh, I would like to add, however, that this all is a great disappointment to those of us who are actively engaged in cancer research and cancer treatment, and that we had anxiously hope for an effective agent and uh, indeed desperately need one. In light of the negative results you witnessed and the government's findings, do you feel that a National Cancer Institute test is justified? You mean clinical trial on patients? Uh, I would say it is not justified. Uh, on the basis that uh, this particular chemical agent would therefore deprive patients of the use of more conventional, effective uh, therapy. Uh, on the other hand, I would feel that uh, if uh, is convinced that there is effectiveness in this compound, that the correct place for trial at this time would be in the animal field. Since early 1963, the Krabiasin controversy has been approaching a climax. In February, the FDA notified Dr. Dorovic that under its regulations, recently strengthened by Congress as a result of the thalidomide tragedy, he would have to file by June 7th a new plan for investigational use of cribiazin on human patients or the drug would be banned from interstate shipment. The plan would have to contain full information as to the drug's safety, its composition and manufacture, and the results of prior testing. Dr. Dorovic was reluctant to file a plan because, he said, he was afraid the FDA was already too prejudiced against Krabiazin to give fair consideration to his application. He also felt that the long-term use of Krabiazin on nearly 5,000 patients constituted sufficient proof of its safety and efficacy. As the June 7th deadline approached, Krabiazin patients throughout the country became alarmed at the prospect of being denied the drug. In May, in New York City, they attempted to organize themselves into a group that could enlist public support and exert pressure on the government. There's no more fundamental right that a man has than to fight for his own life. Even the worst criminal is given a fair trial and uh, due process of law before his life is taken away from him. On June the 27th, next month, uh, the 20th next month, it is seven years that Pat started his combined therapy. There he is. Stand up, Pat. One week later, Krabiazin patients, their families, and friends traveled to Washington, D.C., where Senator Douglas had arranged for them to present their case before members of Congress. I'm not competent to pass on the value of Krabiazin, and I never have done so. But I have believed that uh, very strongly that it should be given a fair test. As a result of this meeting and its attendant publicity, Senator Douglas was able to bring together the Krabiazin sponsors and Food and Drug Administration officials on June 6th. Assured by the government that the application for the drug's continued investigational use would receive fair consideration, Dr. Dorovic filed on June 7th. On June 8th, FDA investigators visited Promac laboratories and demanded an additional supply of Krabiazin for study. Dr. Dorovic provided the Krabiazin under protest and then sought an injunction against the investigators and their superiors in the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, charging harassment. Over the next several weeks, newspapers quoting Food and Drug Administration sources off the record predicted that the drug's ban was imminent. On July 12th, Dr. Dorovic withdrew his application. On July 15th, the government banned Krabiazin from interstate distribution. Dr. Dorovic, 
Why did you withdraw your application from the Food and Drug Administration? Federal Food and Drug Administration was harassing me and trying to smear me by giving false statement to the press or threatening me for indictment. If they succeeded, uh, they would have given an excuse to the National Cancer Institute for not conducting the test on Kribaizu. Therefore, I withdraw my application to protect our chances for this test, which can resolve all this controversy. Although Krabiazin had been banned in every state except Illinois, the FDA was pursuing its investigation of the drug's chemical composition and its production methods and cost. At the same time, the 504 case histories were being studied by 24 cancer specialists selected by the National Cancer Institute in a week-long meeting in a motel outside Washington. The results of this meeting had now become of major importance to Krabiazin sponsors. The Food and Drug Administration ban, however, caused more immediate concern to the several hundred patients who could no longer obtain the drug. Convinced that their lives depended on Krabiazin, they picketed the White House several times during August. Meanwhile, Senator Douglas, joined by Senators Keating, Javits, the late Senator Kefauver, and other prominent lawmakers, had introduced into Congress a joint resolution which directed that the National Institutes of Health be given $250,000 to make a fair, impartial, and controlled test of Krabiazin. At a press conference on September 7th, the Food and Drug Administration made the most dramatic charge yet leveled against Krabiazin. You have... Uh before you now a statement of the department which says that Probiosin has been identified by the Food and Drug Administration as a well-known chemical creatine. Under FDA auspices, four separate research groups had analyzed a sample of the drug using four orthodox definitive methods. As a result, the chemists identified Probiosin as creatine, a common amino acid which both animals and human beings contain in abundance and which possesses no anti-cancer activity. Two days later, Dr. Ivey was interviewed in Chicago. Everybody knows that cribiazin is dissolved or is soluble in mineral oil, number nine light mineral oil. But cre creatine is not soluble in number nine light mineral oil. Anybody can test that for themselves. The molecular weight of creatine is 131. If it has a molecule of water in it, the molecular weight is 149. But the molecular weight reported to us by two different microchemical laboratories for cribiazin is seven times larger approximately, namely 924. Four days later, doctors Ivy and Dorovic held a press conference in New York to counteract the FDA charge. Dr. Ivy elaborated on his Chicago comments concerning creatine. Dr. Dorovic released a letter which he had just sent to the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. In it, he denied the FDA claim, stated that the FDA studies were incomplete, and charged that the results were designed to smear him. He renewed his and Dr. Ivey's offer to cooperate with the FDA in establishing the chemistry of Krabiazin along with the uniformity of its manufacture. At one point, the matter of Krabiazin's cost came into discussion. And when we have money, we will contribute more than nine and a half dollars an ampule. We will contribute to the foundation to the end of our lives, even, and, and this particular uh, case happens to have been halted. It was an end stage case with probiosin. Pain was halted, sleeplessness was halted, coughing on the, as the cancer was halted, and we will continue to contribute. Let this be my final answer to you on the financial aspect of this issue. Who are you with? I am Alexander Gabriel. I have been 17 years correspondent with the United yes. Nations. I'm known to the international community. I'm with the Trans Radio News Agency and have been there as their chief correspondent at the head. I have my wife right over there, who is a blooming girl. After this treatment, and she can come out and show it to you. All the people in the UN tell her how well she looks now, and she did not look before. She was written off by one of the biggest internists in the United States, right here in the city of New York. And I was a skeptic of Corbison 
and I stumbled across it, and I have studied it. I know what the situation is, and I will say right now, right here, I have followed the whole campaign of the Food and Drug Administration, and the doctors here cannot say some things, and I will say it. The Food and Drug Administration has made an agreement in the White House in June with Dr. Ivey to file for them to file an application, and they did. And one of the most cardinal principles of that agreement in set up by Dr. Peter Bing of the White House was that they would not be harassed, that any insufficiency of information would be dealt with and negotiated on the basis of good faith and goodwill. And I called the White House and spoke to Dr. Bing 48 hours later when harassment uh, rumors came out of Chicago, and he admitted in so many words that my allegation that they breached this goodwill agreement and this campaign in the press is on an unseemly approach to a scientific problem. It is not Verizon that is on the spot. It is not the doctors who are on the spot. It is the American conscience and the morality of the American government that is at stake. On October 15th, the National Cancer Institute report on 504 Krabiasin case histories was made public. The committee of experts agreed unanimously the substance possesses no anti-cancer activity in man and recommended that no further consideration be given the substance. We spoke in Washington with Dr. Kenneth Endicott, director of the National Cancer Institute, and with Mr. Beaufilet Jones of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. The Food and Drug Administration uh, undertook an investigation of the drug and it was largely through their efforts that we obtained uh, the additional information on the drug and upon the cases which permitted us to reach a conclusion as to clinical test. The uh, discovery that the drug is creatine uh, coupled with the fact that we found no convincing evidence of any effectiveness in man, uh, so far as we are concerned, uh, closes the matter from a, from a scientific standpoint. There would be no justification in carrying out a trial in man uh, under these circumstances. Of the 504 cases selected from more than 5,000, which were studied by uh, the panel of 24 experts, uh, there were only two which uh, might possibly be interpreted as representing a response from Krabiasin. The experts feel that, that this is about what one would expect in any uh, random sample and have concluded uh, that that uh, Krabiasin is completely without effect. What about Gary Cathcart? Dr. Ivey considered the boy one of his best cases. Well, that uh, is one of the two. And uh, here the reason, there's, there's some reason to, to doubt just what this represents because the, uh, the diagnosis was established on the basis of a frozen section. There was never a permanent section uh, prepared so that there's some uncertainty as to just what type of tumor this patient uh, had. Certainly uh, there has been a response and the patient uh, is still alive. Mr. Jones, what does the Food and Drug Administration plan to do now regarding probiasin? Well, as Dr. Endicott has pointed out, the scientific judgment as to the effectiveness of probiosin in the treatment of cancer has now been determined and concluded. The Food and Drug Administration is continuing its investigation of the activity of the sponsors of probiosin to determine whether or not there has in fact been violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. If so, the normal procedures of the Food and Drug Administration related to its enforcement responsibility will be carried forward. Then is there any way left, Dr. Endicott, for the Krabias and sponsors to get the Cancer Institute to test the drug? Honestly, the only thing that I can see that they can do is to find a new drug that works. 
Now that a Cancer Institute test has been ruled out and the drug banned outside of Illinois, we asked Dr. Ivey what he planned to do. I shall uh, continue my research activities on cribiazin, which are, one, to study, to make it and to study its chemistry, number two, to treat some 50 patients with cribiazin, even if it should become illegal for other physicians to use cribiazin in the state of Illinois, I shall continue all of my research activities on this subject. Dr. Ivey, your involvement with cribiazin over the years has caused you to lose many important positions and has resulted in personal attacks against you. As you look back now, do you have any regrets? No, I have no regrets. I know the history of medical progress so well that personal attacks and difficulties do not bother me. Furthermore, when I first started to work on cribiazin, I desired to stimulate uh, other scientists in the field of cancer to become interested in and to confirm the cribiazin theory, namely that an anti-cancer substance exists in all the multicellular animals and probably plants. During the past two years, the cribiazin theory has been confirmed in part or in toto by at least five different groups of scientists in the United States. Finally, I've been fully repaid by the knowledge of the fact that I have helped relieve the pain in many patients with advanced and hopeless cancer and also to prolong their lives. Since 1958, Senator Paul Douglas of Illinois has been an outspoken supporter for a cribiazin test and a key figure in bringing national attention to the controversy. Senator Douglas, why have you pressed for a National Cancer Institute test? Well, the National Cancer Institute has tested over a thousand chemical products and spent over forty million dollars in doing this. And I believe that the record of cribiazin justified its being one of this thousand. <clears throat> its chief sponsor is Dr. Andrew C. Ivey, one of the great scientists of this nation with an unblemished reputation. Uh, I have seen many, many cases of people who had been on death's door who have, uh, after taking cribiazin, been improved. And I have gone over the statistical records and have found that with competent medical assistance, a great deal of evidence to indicate that it has been beneficial. I felt that all of these factors uh, justified a test. I've never said it was a cure. As a matter of fact, Dr. Ivey's never said it was a cure. I've been open-minded on the subject, but I felt that the Cancer Institute, having tested over a thousand chemical uh, preparations, could test this. Why have you persisted, Senator? when the weight of medical opinion has been so strongly against cribiazin? Well, medical opinion has been against virtually every great step forward in the field of medicine. This was true when Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood and Jenner developed the antitoxin against smallpox. It was true when Semmelweis and Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. pointed out that the reason why women died in childbirth was because the hands of doctors were dirty and went on to where Pasteur discovered the germ theory of disease, Lister antiseptic surgery, and Koch diagnosed tuberculosis. All of these men were fought by the medical profession and nearly driven out of organized medicine. One of them was actually hastened to his death because of the activities of medicine. The med medical people are highly conservative, and the pundits in medicine, the medical politicians, do not like innovation. There are a lot of other circumstances in this particular Krabiazin case which may implicate the American Medical Association itself, but I shall not mention them. I'll merely say that this is too important a subject to be left purely to medical politicians. Do you believe that the National Cancer Institute report is the final word on Krabiazin? Well, I don't know. I'm studying that report with competent medical assistance, but there are certain features connected with the report that I regard as unfortunate. In the first place, although I requested it, 
Dr. Ivey was not permitted to testify or appear before this secret group which uh, met on the matter. In the second place, there is a clear contradiction between the analysis of Krabiasin made last winter by the National Cancer Institute and the present uh, analysis made by the Food and Drug Administration. The National Cancer Institute uh, said that uh, Krabiasin had 22% carbon in it. The Food and Drug uh, uh, administration said it had 38% carbon. And the government is claiming that both of these are correct, which obviously cannot be possible. Now, uh, Food and Drug is saying that carbazin is purely creatine. I don't know about this. Uh, but uh, the previous tests indicated that it was not purely creatine. And there can be slight biological differences which uh, produce uh, tremendous differences in effects. I would say this uh, report needs to be scrutinized and the, all the evidence evaluated. Senator Douglas's committee, headed by Dr. Miles Robinson, pursued its investigation and on December 5th submitted its findings to the Senate. This lengthy report asserts that the government reports, quote, were based on unfair, inaccurate, and prejudiced statements that the Cancer Institute imposed unduly harsh and severe standards of judgment upon Krabiasin, unquote. The report also charges that the photograph released to the press by the FDA showing identical spectrograms for creatine and Krabiasin was a misrepresentation of the truth, that in fact, the two graphs had not been squarely overlaid. At present, Senator Douglas continues to seek support for his bill which demands that a fair clinical test be conducted by the government to determine the value of the substance. In order to ban the sale of Krabiazin in Illinois, the state must have proof that the drug is harmful or ineffective. The federal government maintains it has such evidence, but cannot release it to Illinois until it completes its case against Drs. Ivy and Durovic. After 13 years, then, the Krabiazin story has reached this point. On the one hand, the government agencies and organized medicine are convinced they have proven the material to have absolutely no value. On the other hand, a number of independent doctors and laymen and several prominent lawmakers claim that the drug has never received a fair test and still advocate further scientific examination of it. Apparently, the Krabiasin controversy is not yet ended.